a quorum. Yeah, absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. The Senate's in the midst of 30 hours of debate on the $625 billion defense programs and policy bill for next year. Breaking it down, it's about $527 billion set aside for military bases, $81 billion for the war in Afghanistan. The bill also prohibits the transfer of Guantanamo detainees to the U.S. And we could see a, a vote on final passage on the bill at about 10.30, maybe 11 o'clock tonight. You've also seen senators uh, just moments ago talking about tax policy. Also today, we expect speeches, possibly even votes on a number of executive nominations, including John Koskinen to be become the uh, director of the IRS and Janet Yellen to head up the Fed. Current chair Ben Bernanke will be stepping down next month. The federal budget, by the way, approved yesterday. That two-year measure agreed to here in the Senate with bipartisan support. The vote 64 to 36. It awaits President Obama's signature. Mr. President. Senator from Ohio. Mr. President, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Mr. President, I rise today along with my colleague from New Hampshire, uh, Senator Shaheen, to talk about the Energy Savings and Industrial Competitiveness Act. Now, this is one of those pieces of legislation that we ought to pass around here. It's bipartisan. It's good for the country. It's part of an energy plan for America that can help bring the jobs back, help fix our trade deficit, uh, help make our manufacturers more competitive, uh, help save taxpayers money, and actually help to clean the environment. Uh, that all sounds pretty good, doesn't it? And it does so without a single mandate. It does so without any new spending. It's fully offset. And in fact, uh, I would make the strong argument it's going to save taxpayers a lot of money. Why? Because by putting energy efficiency in place in the federal government, the biggest user of energy in the world, uh, we're going to see a lot of savings to all of us as taxpayers. Over the past several months, uh, we've been working to clear a few last hurdles that stand in the way of passing this piece of legislation. Uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, I believe from what I'm hearing from the other side of the aisle, and, and Senator Shaheen can talk more about this, that it looks like we're going to have a good shot to finally move this early next year. So before we leave for the holidays, uh, I wanted to have a chance to talk about it a little bit, as Senator Shaheen did. I know Senator Wyden, who's here with us, the chairman, and Senator Murkowski, the ranking member of Energy, are all highly supportive of this legislation. After all, it got out of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee with a strong bipartisan vote, 19 to 3. Uh, this doesn't often happen with regard to energy policy around this place. Uh, this is one of those things where Republicans and Democrats alike can come together to do something good for our country. It's also important that we do it now because uh, it gives the economy a shot in the arm at a time when we need it. There's a lot of talk in this place about all the above energy strategy. And to me, this fits perfectly with an all the above energy strategy. On this side of the aisle, we talk a little more about the production side. In other words, we ought to be using more of the energy that's in the ground in America right now, and I think we should. We should be producing more energy. 
At the same time, that energy that we produce, we should use more efficiently. And it has all those benefits we talked about earlier if you do that. Uh, we still import a lot of oil. In combination with China, it, it uh, contributes to our trade deficit. In fact, the entire trade deficit, you could say, is due to both energy imports and uh, trade with China alone. So by doing away with some of those energy imports, because we're using what energy we have more efficiently here, we're going to see lower trade deficits. The bill creates jobs, and that's why it's supported by over 260 trade associations and companies, including the Chamber of Commerce, National Association of Manufacturers, and others. Uh, but it's also good for the environment, which is why the coalition also includes the Alliance to Save Energy, the Sierra Club, and others. And again, a big reason why this passed the United States uh, Commerce or uh, Energy and Natural Resources Committee with a bipartisan vote of 19 to 3. Simply put, the legislation that the Senior Center of New Hampshire and I have worked on now for, what, two and a half years, uh, makes good environmental sense, it makes good energy sense, it makes good economic sense, it makes sense to help move this economy forward. I've visited with businesses and job creators all over my state of Ohio, and they tell me the same thing. Energy efficiency is critical to their ability to compete. And you think about it, we do live in a global economy. We live in an economy where we're competing in Ohio, not just with Indiana, but with India. And as a result, we've got to look at our cost of doing business. And one cost of doing business, of course, is labor. We don't want to compete with developing countries on labor rates. <laughs> we want our labor rates to be good. We want benefits to be good. Uh, another thing we could look at, of course, is uh, the quality of our goods. We don't want to cut corners on the quality of the high quality of manufactured products we produce in this country. In fact, we want to be sure we're producing the best in the world. But energy, energy is an area where we can cut costs. By making our manufacturers more competitive, by reducing their costs, we're going to be able to compete globally, add more jobs in this country, and again, be able to help on our trade deficit. That's why this legislation is so important, because what the federal government can do is help the private sector take advantage of the best research that's out there, the best practices that are out there, so that our companies can reduce their costs putting those savings toward expanding companies, plant and equipment, hiring more workers. The proposals contained in this bill, I think, are very common sense reforms and have been needed for a long time. Again, no mandates on the private sector, none. In fact, many of our proposals come as a direct result from conversations we've had with people in the private sector as to what they actually want and need. That's how we put this thing together. It's also about how the federal government can become more energy efficient. We talked earlier about the fact the federal government's the largest user of energy in the world. Think about that. And our bill basically says, the federal government, why don't you start practicing what you preach? There's a lot of talk about green, green energy, green technology, and so on at the federal government level, but actually it turns out the federal government itself is inefficient. And we've got lots of studies that show that. More importantly, we've got ideas to make the federal government more efficient, less wasteful. It directs the Department of Energy to issue recommendations that employ energy efficiency on everything from computer hardware to operations and maintenance processes, energy efficiency software, power management tools. It also takes the common sense step of allowing the General Services Administration, that's the group that controls all the many federal buildings, offices, and so on. It allows them to update the building designs they've got right now in the works to meet new efficiency standards that have been developed since those designs were finalized. You can't do that now. That makes no sense. So look, the federal government has been looking for places to tighten its belt. Energy efficiency is a really good place to start. It will save taxpayer money and help the environment in the process. All this adds up to a piece of legislation that Americans across the spectrum, the political spectrum, should be able to support. Again, fully offset, no mandates, requires the federal government to become more efficient. All this makes sense. What will the impact be? Well, there's a recent study of our legislation. It says that by 2025, the Sheehan-Portman legislation is estimated to aid in the creation of 136,000 new jobs while saving consumers $13.7 billion a year in reduced energy costs by the year 2030. It's the equivalent of taking millions of home off, homes off the grid. It's equivalent of the entire energy use of the state of Oklahoma, for instance if we just put some of these common sense efficiency standards in place. This legislation is not everything everybody wanted, okay? Some of the environmental groups would like to have gone further. Some of the business groups probably would like to see some other stuff that would help them. But this is legislation that is sensible, 
It will make a difference. It is bipartisan. It can pass in the United States Senate. Significantly, it can also be legislation that will be mirrored in the House of Representatives and passed. There is a bicameral interest in this. A number of House Democrats and Republicans are on board. They're interested in us moving this legislation in part so that they can then move that legislation in the House. We can get it to the President's desk for his signature. The Secretary of Energy has made efficiency one of his new priorities. So this is something that we should and can do. We all often lament the fact that there's not much bipartisanship around this place and not much is getting done, and it's true. It's true. The budget agreement uh, was good this week. We had to do something. Uh, far from perfect, as, as I've said, even though at the end I voted for it because I do think we needed to move forward on this issue and have a budget for the first time in four years in this place. But this is an example of legislation that's actually something bipartisan positive to help move the country forward. Any true all of the above energy strategy has to include not just producing more energy, but also using that energy more efficiently. Produce more, use less. That's good for jobs, good for taxpayers, good for the environment. Mr. President, I now yield back my time, and I hope that we hear from the Senator from New Hampshire, who's been my partner in this for the past two and a half years. Mr. President. The Senator from New Hampshire. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I'm really pleased to be here on the floor today with, um, as he put it so well, Senator Portman, my partner in developing this energy efficiency legislation, the Energy Efficiency and Industrial Competitiveness Act, also known as Shaheen Portman. Um, it's a long name, but as he pointed out, it really goes a long way to address some of the energy challenges we face in this country. It is a win-win-win. And we heard earlier today a discussion about the importance of renewable energy as a way to create jobs. Well, this is one of the most important things, I think, about our legislation, is that it does promote job creation. Um, as the American Council for an Energy Efficient economy said 136,000 new jobs would be created by 2025 if we passed the legislation. By 2030, it would net an annual savings of almost $14 billion, $13.7 billion for consumers, and it would lower CO2 emissions and other air pollutants by the equivalent of taking 22 million cars off the road. So, as Senator Portman said so well, this is a win for job creation, it is a win for the environment, it is a win for national security, and it is a win for saving costs. Now, Senator Portman talked about the importance of continuing the bipartisan efforts that we saw this week with passing a budget. Um, like Senator Portman, I, I supported that budget as well, despite some of the misgivings I had about it, but I think it was important to work together to move forward on addressing the issues that we face in this country. And that's exactly what the Energy Savings and Industrial Competitiveness Act would do. It's a bill that will create jobs, lower pollution, and save taxpayers money. And we had a great opportunity to pass this legislation back in September. Um, unfortunately, we saw some People come to the floor and object because of non-relevant amendments, and, um, but we have an opportunity to come back to it in the new year and to try and pass it again. And I'm hoping that we can do that, and one reason we're here on the floor today is to talk about that second opportunity that we're going to have. And as Senator Portman and I have been working on some of the bipartisan amendments that have been offered for the bill, and we're hopeful that some of our colleagues who support those bipartisan amendments, who have authored them, will come on board with this legislation and will help us get this passed in the new year. Now, as Senator Portman said, to date, this legislation has more than 260 endorsements from groups that include business, the environment, think tanks, trade associations, Supporters include everybody from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, the Nat Natural Resources Defense Council, and the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades. I think any time you can get the Sierra Club and the American Chemistry Council supporting a piece of legislation, you know you've got a good 
bill that can attract a lot of support. And that's where we are in this legislation. Um, but as, as we know, passage of the bill was delayed by a small group of senators back in January, or back in September. Um, but there still remains a real interest, I think, in debating energy efficiency policy on the floor of the Senate. Um, we've also heard from the House that both Representative Spread Upton, Chair of the House and Energy and Commerce Committee, and Ed Whitfield, Chair of the relevant subcommittee with jurisdiction over energy efficiency, have expressed interest in Shaheen Portman and said that they will move energy efficiency legislation if the Senate passes a bill. Now, since the bill was taken off the floor, Senator Portman and I have continued to work with Chairman Wyden. He was here a few minutes ago and plans to come back hopefully to speak to the legislation. We've been working with Ranking Member Murkowski to incorporate some of those relevant bipartisan amendments that have been cleared by the committee that I talked about a few minutes ago. Um, this, if we can do that, if we can include those amendments, it would make the legislation even better. It would secure additional support that are necessary to ensure passage, and it would allow us, I hope, assuming the leadership agrees to bring this bill back to the floor. I, I'm confident that we can pass this legislation if we can get it back to the floor. It has bipartisan, bicameral support. It's exactly the kind of smart, affordable energy and jobs bill that Congress needs to pass, that the President needs to sign in order to spur private sector growth, in order to save on costs of energy, and in order to address some of the environmental issues that we're facing. So I want to thank Senator Portman. I want to thank Chairman Wyden and Ranking Member Murkowski for all of their help in working with us to promote this legislation and advance the bill. And I really look forward to working with those 260 groups, um, which also include the Alliance to Save Energy, which I think it's important to recognize them for their support. But to be able to bring this bill back, to get it through, and to really for the first time since 2007, get some energy policy done on the, in this Senate. So thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I yield the floor, and thanks to my colleague, Senator Portman, we will be back after January. The Senator from Florida. Mr. President, I know we are awaiting uh, the arrival of Senator Johnson, uh, and I just want to take a moment to express my appreciation to the majority leader for uh, including in the items that uh, we will be uh, handling uh, before we adjourn for Christmas the fact that he put uh, on the agenda uh, the confirmation of Judge Brian Davis to the U.S. District Court for the Middle District of Florida uh, Judge Davis has been waiting for two years. Now, this is a good example of how things have uh, gone very slowly for a very deserving judge. 658 days. Uh, he has the support of Senator Rubio and me, the American Bar Association, has found him to be unanimously well qualified to serve on the federal district court, and it is his, it's the ABA's highest rating. He's a native Floridian who, Mr. President, grew up as an African American in segregated Jacksonville, Florida, and despite those circumstances, was accepted to Princeton uh, for his college education. Uh, returned later to the University of Florida Law School and then became a top prosecutor in Jacksonville and 20 years ago went on the bench as a state circuit judge uh, and he has an impeccable record uh, he is, in a huge bipartisan way, embraced by the lawyers who have practiced in front of him. And yet, it's taken us 658 days. 
And I just want to thank the majority leader. I want to thank the Senate. I want to thank Senator Grassley, who initially had concerns, but when Senator Grassley looked at the record, uh, he had an open mind. And then he saw the character, the quality, the excellence of Judge Davis. There are 37 judicial emergencies around the country, and two of them are in the Middle District of Florida, where Judge Davis is, and three of them are in the Southern District of Florida. The courts are overburdened, and we need to fill these vacancies. And so I, I just want to thank the Senate in advance for giving this good man, this excellent jurist, uh, the opportunity to serve in a greater capacity to serve his country. And um, I'm, I'm, this is, I want you to know, this is a great Christmas present for me, uh, but it's nothing like the Christmas present that it's going to be for Judge Brian Davis and his family. Mr. President, I yield the floor. The Senator from South Dakota. Mr. President, I rise to speak in support of Dr. Janet Yellen to be chair of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. As we continue to recover from the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, we need a strong and thoughtful chairman of the Federal Reserve. We need a chair who has learned from our economic successes and mistakes over the past several decades. We need a chair who understands how monetary policy affects the everyday lives of Americans seeking employment or saving for retirement. And we need a chair who understands the importance of implementing Wall Street reform to promote financial stability. Dr. Yellen has all these qualities and she is ideally suited to be the next Fed chair. Dr. Yellen's experience is unmatched. She currently serves as a member and vice chair of the Board of Governors. She previously served as a member of the Board of Governors in the 1990s. She was chair of President Clinton's Council of Economic Advisors, and she serves six six years as president of the San Francisco Fed. Dr. Yellen also has an impressive academic record. She is a professor at Berkeley's Haas School of Business and was previously a professor at Harvard University as well as a faculty member at the London School of Economics. Dr. Yellen graduated summa cum laude from Brown University and received her PhD in economics from Yale. Dr. Yellen has written numerous research papers on the library market, unemployment, monetary policy, and the economy. Her expertise in these areas, including her understanding of the relationship between Fed policy and the labor market, would be valuable as we chart the course back to pull employment. But you don't have to take my word for it. Dr. Yellen's economic expertise is borne out by the facts. The New York Times recently noted that she was, quote, the first Fed official in 2005 to describe the rise in housing prices as a bubble that might damage the economy. She was also the first in 2008 to see that the economy had fallen into a recession, end quote. And the Wall Street Journal recently, it recently analyzed 700 predictions made between 2009 and 2012 in speeches and congressional testimony by 14 Fed Reserve policymakers and found Dr. Yellen was the most accurate. 
At her confirmation hearing, Dr. Yellen displayed her impressive understanding of our complex 21st century economy. She showed that she understands the complexities of Fed policy making and that though abstract to many, monetary policy has ripple effects that affect the everyday lives of workers, savers, small businesses, and job seekers. Dr. Yellen has proven through her extensive and impressive record in public service that academia, that she is most qualified to be the next chair of the Federal Reserve. We need her expertise at the helm of the Fed as her nation continues to recover from the Great Recession, completes Wall Street reform rural Lincolns, and continues to enhance the stability of our financial sector. I'm excited to cast my vote to confirm her as the first woman to serve as chair of the Federal Reserve, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. You yield the floor. The senator from Louisiana. Mr. President. Mr. President, before my colleague leaves the floor, I want to just thank him for his leadership of the Banking Committee in the Senate uh, for now several years and his commitment to try to find the right regulatory framework for the largest banks in our country as well as our community banks. And I think the chairman has had a lot of challenges, as we all have, and I just want to thank him and for his strong advocacy of this particular um, nominee. Uh, and for his help on so many issues, uh, one of which I'm going to uh, speak about now with colleagues uh, from Florida and from uh, New York. Mr. President, uh, many of us uh, on both sides of the aisle from all parts of the country have been working very hard for the last year, and some of us even longer than that, to try to um, present good, solid information to the Senate and to Congress about how important the National Flood Insurance Program is in many different dimensions. First of all, for those that live along the coast, which is 60 percent of our population in the United States, and those that live on inland waterways, whether it's in your state of New Jersey, in states like Pennsylvania, in states like New Mexico, uh, North Dakota, not near any ocean, <laughs> or whether it's states like Florida, Louisiana, that do sit on both the, um, in Florida's case, the Atlantic, and our case, the Gulf of Mexico. This is a very important issue because our businesses and our families have to have a, a system of very strong levies, smart building codes, uh, and ways of building and expanding our communities with a good flood insurance um, safety net, if you will, or security net, along with levees that don't break, <laughs> like they did in New Orleans in 52 places and three quarters of a great international city of a half a million people in a region of almost 1.2 million virtually went underwater. Now, we have to do better than that because we're the greatest nation in the world, we're the greatest economy, and this is an important issue for the nation. And so some of us in places like this spend a lot of time thinking about levy infrastructure, flood protection, all of the different pieces. And it's not just one piece. Insurance is a very important piece, as my colleague from Florida will explain in just a minute, he was a former insurance commissioner and knows this as well as anyone in this body. But flood insurance is one piece for Americans that live, some in low-lying areas, some in flood-prone areas, um, but they've been there a long time, like 300 years in our case. I mean, they just didn't move down here in the 1980s. I mean, we've been here since the 1780s and the 1680s. So, We've been here a long time as a country. We've built up a, uh, a, a protection, if you will, of good, solid, affordable flood insurance, 
since the last 40 years. We've been building levees a long time. Thank goodness we're building more of them and building them better because our people need them and we could all use more of those. I try to provide funding for that every chance I can as a member of that Appropriations Committee. And we're promoting, Mr. President, contrary to some of our critics, we're promoting very good policies in this country about smart growth, how to build stronger, higher, more resiliently. We're not blind to the challenges, but we have right now before this body a flood insurance bill that will fix the most pernicious parts of a quote reform bill that was passed two years ago called Bigger Waters with all the best intentions, but it had disastrous, disastrous consequences for people in New Jersey, Florida, New York, Louisiana, Texas. There are five million policies. I want to just put up one chart and then I'm going to turn it over to the senators uh, that want to join me. But just so that critics say this is just a Louisiana issue or this is just a Florida issue or you know, this really is not about anything other than coastal states, let me put that to rest. That is not factual. It is a damaging myth. You can see here all of the flood maps that are in effect or in purple. These are Mardi Gras colors in honor of our season coming up after Christmas, but this is um, flood maps in purple that exist as of July 12th. These are proposed flood maps in green and new flood maps in yellow. Literally, there will not be a state in the Union, not one state in the Union, not one, <laughs> that is exempt from the requirements of Bigger Waters to produce new flood maps, some of which have not been produced for decades, putting communities that have never been in a flood zone in a flood zone, and then having these pernicious pieces of Bigger Waters say, okay, you've never flooded, you've never been in a flood zone, but let me tell you that when you put your house up for sale, your rates are going to go up 10%. It's like stealing, taking whatever word you want to call it, the equity right out of someone's home. It is unconscionable, and it must be fixed now. Not a year from now. Now. These rates have gone up in October, in January. So I'm just here to say a couple of things. This is a national issue, number one. Number two, we put a great coalition, very proud, of putting a coalition, and the leaders of this coalition are Senator Menendez from New Jersey, your senior senator, Mr. President, who's worked so hard, and uh, our Republican leader, who everyone has a lot of respect for, uh, Johnny Isaacson from Georgia, who is an expert and is recognized as an expert in the real estate uh, markets of this country. It's his expertise. We should listen to him when he says, Real estate markets are going to take a terrible hit if we can't fix this. And the final point is this is not just to help homeowners and businesses. It's also to save the program because, as Chuck Schumer has said, the senator from New York many times, if we don't fix this, not only will people not be able to afford the insurance to buy it, but because they can't, the program will collapse under its own weight of inaccessibility and unaffordability, and then the taxpayer is going to pick up a bigger tab. We couldn't make any clearer, more stronger arguments. A coalition has come together. We have 60 votes. I see my colleagues from Florida, from New York. I don't know what their schedules are uh, in terms of time. The senator from Florida is well versed. And as again, as through the chair, the senator from Florida served before as a senator, as an insurance commissioner, and I'd like for him to add a word because our goal today is to acknowledge that unfortunately because of the difficulties we're having on process, we're not able to get a vote, it looks like, before we leave, but we are under the understanding, and I want to ask the senator, that Leader Reid has agreed to call this bill up for a vote for a cloture vote in which we have accepted the 60 vote threshold. We believe we have actually more than 60 votes. We just need to get it up when we come back in early January. Is that, Senator, through the chair, your understanding? It is my understanding, but uh, 
in the new found uh, felicity and spirit of the season? Wouldn't you think that since the real estate market along the coast has dried up, why, Mr. President? Because if you can't get flood insurance because you can't afford it, you can't get a mortgage. If you can't get a mortgage, there are a lot of folks that can't buy a house. And by the way, those who need to sell their houses, they can't get the buyers. And so what happens to the real estate market in places like the Tampa Bay region of Florida, as chronicled by the Tampa Bay Times, an example that a homeowner's present flood insurance premium is $4,000. The new bill, $44,000. That's unaffordable. So what we're merely asking for is that FEMA do an affordability study while this thing is delayed for a few years to determine what is the affordability. Now, if this thing is supposed to be actuarially sound, then that came as a result of huge losses to the program because of an unusual thing. Not a hurricane called Katrina, but because the waters rose, it put pressure on the dikes and it breached the levees that flooded the bowl called New Orleans. And that caused lots of economic loss and they're figuring all of that in the flood insurance premiums. And oh, by the way, 40% of all those flood insurance policies are in my state of Florida. Now, I, before we hear from the senator from New York, I just want to say this. Floods come from many sources. Obviously, floods come from hurricanes. People used to think that hurricanes were Florida's problem. Well, now we know, because of the experience on the Gulf Coast, they can do an awful lot of damage in many different ways. But oh, by the way, people up in the Northeast suddenly realize that hurricanes are a problem. Now, why? Because the ocean temperature is rising, and when the water gets warmer, the frequency of the storms is more, and the ferocity of the storms is greater. And thus, in a time when it's normally cool water, cold air temperature, all of a sudden we've got a major storm that comes to a part of the country that is completely unprepared, and now not only all the damage from the water and the wind, and think what happened all the way up into New England, all the way up into Vermont. You heard about all those rivers that suddenly completely overran and, and, and inundated that little town uh, with a bunch of water, and they're, they're calling this a thousand-year storm. But the thousand-year storm happened a year ago. Now, I'm not here to speak about climate change, which I certainly think we better get our heads out of the sand. I'm here to talk about an immediate problem for the people all up and down the coast of the United States, and that is the affordability of health insurance. So why wouldn't our colleagues give us a little Christmas present since we've got over 60 votes in the Senate? And let's give some hope to those homeowners back home who now cannot afford flood insurance. I, I want to hear from the senator from New York who has been a leader on this, and his state has suffered. And fortunately, it's going to take folks like him and, and the great senator from Louisiana to keep beating this drum to bring some relief to our people that are desperate. Mr. President, I yield the floor.
The Mr. Senator from New York. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, before I get into the substance of remarks, I have a unanimous consent request for a committee to meet during today's session of the Senate. It has the approval of the majority and minority leaders. I ask unanimous consent this request be agreed to, the request be printed in the record. Without exception? exception? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And I just want to echo the outstanding words of my colleagues from both Florida and Louisiana. And they echo the views of many. You know, Mr. President, everyone says public is exasperated with the Congress. Our approval ratings are low. They are. Why? It's simply because when huge problems occur that affect ordinary people, we seem paralyzed. And what's happening with flood insurance embodies just what I'm talking about. Average homeowners who purchase flood insurance through the years for $800, $1,000, are now being hit with bills four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000. Now, if you're rich, that's nothing. But the vast majority of people who have flood insurance, whether they live on the oceans in my state or the senator, for, or the senator from Florida state or on the Gulf, the senator of Louisiana state, or on the bodies of water like the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, they are not wealthy people. And you tell them all of a sudden, out of the clear blue, they've got to pay four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000 for flood insurance, they don't know what to do. It's a crisis for them. And they say to us, Congress, fix this. This is what we're supposed to do. And so, in their wisdom, the senator from New Jersey, the senator from Louisiana, the senator from Georgia, the senator from Florida, myself, many others, have come up with a proposal that says we know flood insurance is broken, but we don't want it to be broken on the backs of average homeowners. We have a plan that will delay these increases till 2017 while FEMA studies affordability and while Congress re-examines this issue. There was an affordability study in Bigger Water. Somehow FEMA ignored it. And we're not letting that happen. And so that's why we have to act here. There are three types of people who are in danger. The first are those who know or are about to know they're going to be hit. They have flood insurance already, and, they're, and they're, the cost is going to go way up. Vast majority, middle class people. The second are those who will be told, your insurance won't go up, but when you sell your home, it's going to go way up. And any bureaucrat who tells us, well, that doesn't affect the average person, it affects the value of their home immediately. But it also says they can't sell their home in my area, if flood insurance is going to be eight or ten or even twenty thousand dollars a year, who's going to buy the home? Except at a greatly reduced value. But my colleagues, there's a third group, and they don't know who they are. FEMA is changing flood maps throughout the country, and they will get to your state, unless maybe, you know, Utah or a state like that doesn't have any flood insurance. I don't know. But the vast majority of our states that either bound the Great Lakes, the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf, the Great Rivers, the Mississippi, the Missouri, the Ohio, the Platte, are all going to be affected. And a year from now, your constituents are going to come to you and say, stop this. So this will affect the overwhelming majority of states and senators even if they don't know it now. And so our solution is not an ideological solution. It's not a solution that picks one side or the other. It says, just put a moratorium on this stuff until we can figure this out in a right way that doesn't put the burden of flood insurance solely on the backs of people who can't afford it, average folks. My state. My good friend from Florida mentioned it. We have people who have struggled to fix up their homes in Sandy, spending tens, even hundreds of thousands of dollars, and then all of a sudden they're hit with a huge flood insurance bill. Woo! They're already in debt. That's not fair. Just when they've moved back in, finally, into their homes, FEMA comes in and tells them in a year or two they can't afford to live in those homes that they have fixed up. That's intolerable. 
So, bottom line is simple. We have a good piece of legislation. We would hope we could pass it unanimous by unanimous consent, as my colleague from Florida and Louisiana have said, is a nice Christmas, not present, but because it's not a present. These are, people deserve to have this, but it's a nice Christmas thought. But if not, we will come back in January. That is my expectation. That is what the leader has told us. And we are willing to go through a cloture vote and bring this legislation to the floor. And we expect and hope it will get the same kind of bipartisan support that has helped us put this bill together with senators from every part of the country. So I would say to homeowners, it is my hope and prayer and indeed expectation, although around here expectations sometimes are not met, that we will have this bill on the floor and then passed so that homeowners, millions of homeowners across America can breathe a sigh of relief. They can stay in their homes and flood insurance will be mended in the right way. Would the yield. Senator yield be for happy question? to yield for a question. Through the chair, would the senator yield? Um, could you explain just a little bit more clearly for so many people that are listening to what we're saying this morning? Because you've been around here a while and in the leadership, when the leader Harry Reid uh, rule 14s a piece of legislation, how sure are we that we're going to get a vote? What is required, and can we be? Because I've been saying I'm very confident that this vote will occur sometime the week or two we get back. What is your understanding, My Senator? My understanding is just that, that in the first, even possibly in the first week when we get back, that the leader, having ruled 14 this, which means he can bring it to the floor right away, can put it on the floor, and then, of course, people can demand, those opposed can demand uh, that we... Uh, vote cloture so we can proceed to the bill and then vote on the bill. But if we have 60 votes, we will be able to meet that cloture barrier. And so uh, it is my understanding that the plan is to actually do it as soon in January as the first week we get back, which I believe is the 6th. Um, if we can't do it then, we will be pushing very hard to do it shortly thereafter. And is the senator aware of a comparable effort going on in the House. He's been at a couple of news conferences with us and could you maybe give a minute to explain, do you think there's pretty good support building in the House of Representatives from your delegation in New York as well as other delegations that you might be aware of? Well, Mr. President, I thank my colleague for that question and exactly. This, since this is affecting so many people in so many parts of the country, and it doesn't affect just Democrats or just Republicans, just conservatives or moderates, independents or liberals, the support is building daily, and senators and Congress members are getting calls from their constituents pleading with them to do something. And so it is my view, it is my understanding that the House is undertaking a very similar piece of legislation, and uh, I would expect it would pass the House where they don't even need the 60-vote majority. And I know in my delegation it has bipartisan support, and as I understand it, in most delegations it has bipartisan support. And would the senator from Florida just give a, a thought? Thank you. The senator from Florida, through the chair, what is your understanding of the Florida delegation? You're one of the largest states in the union and have one of the largest delegations. Is it something that you're sensing people are becoming more and more aware of, not just on the coastal counties, but throughout all parts of Florida? Mr. President, in response, the senator from Florida, in response to the senator, uh, the Florida delegation is clearly united in recognizing that if you can't sell your home because you can't get a mortgage because the bank requires flood insurance and you can't afford the flood insurance, the real estate market starts to drive up. And in a state like Florida, the real estate market is one of the main economic engines uh, that uh, fuels uh, the ability of people to have work and to be able to support their families. And as a result, uh, we are seeing in places along the coast with 
taking examples, that was a tenfold increase from 4,000 to 44,000, a flood insurance premium told by the Tampa Bay Times. It is not only ridiculous, it is stunning to the point that people can't believe that something is facing them in their personal lives with their homes that could be so easily taken care of if we could get the approvals to get the legislation that we already have 60 votes or more for. They just can't believe that people are opposing bringing up this legislation to fix something that is so obviously in need of fixing. I thank the senator from Florida. I don't, if, I'd like to ask unanimous consent if we want to extend our colloquy, but I think I'm going to just wrap up with a few uh, remarks for about five minutes. I see the senator from Texas on the floor, and he may, may want to speak. But let me just put a couple of, I think, really startling facts, thank you, senator, uh, in the record. There are over 450 counties, parishes, and boroughs are located directly on open ocean, the Great Lakes, major estuaries, or in coastal floodplains. Now we will know from our geography that there are over 3,000, to be exact, 3,144 counties, parishes in our case, boroughs and some, uh, in the country. But this is the important fact here. In 2010, these coastal counties contributed more than 8.3 trillion, which is 55% of the national economy. And I want to underscore that and highlight it just for the, the importance of this. Through 3,100 counties, but there's a subset of those counties which are mostly affected by this particular issue flood control and flood protection that produce 55% of the GDP for this country. So, yes, this is a homeowner's issue. It's a middle class issue. It's a, they're suffering, let's relieve the pain. But it's also a, we better wake up and realize the economic impact that this is going to have on the entire country if this is not fixed. This is not about millionaires on a beach. It's about the future of the economic strength of America. And I cannot be more emphatic about that, and it is not overstating our challenge. This is not about millionaires. It's about the middle class. It's about the middle class who need affordable insurance so that they can live where they need to work Okay, let me say that. Live where they need to work, not rest where they need to vacation. There's a big myth here that flood insurance is about resting on vacation. <laughs> flood insurance is about working hard where you need to work to keep this economy moving forward Nothing could be more clear than in the state of Louisiana, but this is true in Texas. This is true in New Jersey. This is true in many places in California, in our country. People live near the water to harvest seafood, to produce domestic energy, to manufacture and transport the goods necessary to keep this economy moving. If you shut down these communities, because of a capricious law like this that was not well thought through, that was not fully debated the way that it should have throughout this Congress, you're jeopardizing not only the dreams of these particular homeowners and business owners, but you're going to hear this from me, you're jeopardizing the future of the economy in the United States. Now, we cannot let this get any further than it has gone, or you will start feeling the ramifications. Again, this is not flood insurance for people resting on vacation. This is flood insurance for people working every day because they need to work where they live 
to do the jobs that our economy requires. And so this graph up here, I showed this flood map graph just a few minutes ago, which is where all the flood maps are going to be. No state is, um, is exempt, not one. Clustered in some areas more than others, but not one state exempt. You know, heads up to Oregon, Washington, California, Pennsylvania, Michigan, of course, the East Coast, the Gulf Coast, and everywhere in between. But this is where levees are. I know a lot about levees. I, unfortunately, I have to know a lot about them because we've got a lot of them and they break too, too, too often and, and breach too often. And I'm trying to figure out ways to build them higher and better with nickels and dimes and trying to piece it together. I was surprised that there are so many levees in other parts of the country that I was not aware of. And so this is a big issue, flood protection, particularly with our sea levels rising, the weather patterns getting more erratic, flash floods happening in deserts. Colorado, look here, this is not even around an ocean. How could you have millionaires on a beach when there's no beach? <laughs> I mean, there are millionaires in Colorado, but there's no ocean. So this visual that some critics have painted is so wrong. It's so distorted. But what Colorado does have, and look at, at Arizona, um, they have these flash floods, these, these important flood controls for people even that live in dry parts of our country. So I have to just say that we, we just have to fix this. And the great news is we have a bill that is broadly supported, both Republicans and Democrats. I'm sorry that there is seemingly one objection from the other side. Uh, the Republican senator from uh, Idaho, many colleagues are talking with him about lifting uh, his objections. If he's got suggestions for amendments, we are flexible. We are open to hear any reasonable suggestions. But we've got more than 60 votes. And around here, in the old days, when you had 60 votes, you could do a lot. But unfortunately, there's some people that think that you've got to have 100 votes to do anything, and that's a big problem. It's a big problem for our democracy because that's not the way it was structured to be. However, um, we're going to continue to work. I thank the coalition, and um, I just want to um, read one uh, couple of things into the record, and I'll turn the floor over in a minute. I have in, on my website, and I've encouraged senators to have my home, my story. They're literally hundreds every day that come into my office with a picture of the house and their individual stories. And I think it's worth reading one or two into this record just briefly. Uh, this is from the New Orleans area where there are 303,000 um, policies. This particular is from Jefferson Parish, which has the most insurance um, policies which is the suburb of New Orleans than any parish in our state. Richard of Metairie writes, my wife and I purchased this as our first and so far only house in the fall of 1997. We put down roots, befriended our neighbors, hosted family gatherings, celebrated the birth of our daughter. If the rate increases we're hearing about go forward, you will have succeeded in doing what Katrina didn't, break the back of Southeast Louisiana. Homes will be unsellable, businesses will be shut, banks will fail from the doubtless tens of thousands of defaults that will occur as people simply walk away from their now worthless homes. I don't know how clearer we could be, and this is not an exaggeration. The data shows it. The coalition has proved it. We are building tremendous support, and I can only hope that we vote as soon as possible within the first week of coming back. Wendy of Metairie, another person from Jefferson Parish, I built my house three feet above the required flood elevation in 1998. Now the elimination of the grandfather clause, I will be paying $28,000 a year for flood insurance. Why should we be penalized for building our houses in compliance with the law? Now, that is a very good question. 
And I don't have an answer for her other than to say, we hear you, and we're changing the law. It was poorly designed, and it can be fixed, and it should be fixed. And finally, let me just give um, from Baton Rouge, which is our capital city now, uh, because so many people were uh, literally flooded uh, out of uh, the New Orleans southeastern part of our state. Baton Rouge is now the largest city, almost 500,000 people. Ken writes, my wife and I live on Social Security and a small annuity from my work. We have lived in this house for 37 years. All of our bills take almost all of the income. We constantly look at our finances to see if there's anything we can cut or reduce. Any increase in flood insurance may be an increase to my house note beyond our capacity to pay for it. Brian of Baton Rouge, my house was built in 1969, before there were flood maps. I accepted a job in Tennessee, thought my house would sell. I have a neighbor that wants to buy my house. They have withdrawn their offer since they found out how much flood insurance will be. Flood insurance rates hike on the simple single property affects three families, my family, the family I want to buy from, and the family that wants to build my house. I want to underscore this and I'm going to end with this. I want people to get a picture of the five million people caught in this web and think, well, we have a lot of people in America, we have 350 million, this is 5 million, let's say 2 per house, that's only 10 million, this is a very small number compared to 350, maybe we don't need to pay attention to those 10 million people. But every home has a buyer and a seller, and most every home has a bank. Most every home has a worker or two, or sometimes three in that house, it's affecting so many businesses. If this gentleman can't get his finances straight, he will leave his job in Tennessee. The business in Tennessee that's not anywhere near an ocean will be affected by that. Madam President, I know I sound a little bit like a broken record here, and I don't mean to, but this is serious for the whole country. So I want to end by thanking Harry Reid for understanding this, for hearing us amidst all of the yelling and screaming that's going on around here about this and that, he has been able to focus and understand that this is an important bill for the country, and he has agreed to use his power, which he has only, only the leader has this power, to pull a bill from the calendar, and he's promised us that he will do that the first week we get back, and then it's our job to deliver the 60 votes to pass it. If we don't get 60 votes, the bill will fail, and it will be a terrible shame. But I don't think this bill will fail, because I know how important this issue is for every single member of this, of this Senate. And I know they're hearing from their middle class homeowners and lower income homeowners and businesses, bankers and realtors. And all I can say is we're just going to have to work over the holidays. Unfortunately, we'd like to rest, but you know, no rest for the weary here. And we're going to have to work hard to convince as many people so we have this vote successfully when we get back. I'm going to submit the rest of my statement for the record, hundreds, hundreds of personal uh, requests that I have received. I know Senator Vitter has received the same, and I thank him for his help on this as well. Uh, again, this is a Democrat and Republican uh, working together to get the job done, and I yield the floor. Madam President. The Republican Whip. Madam President, as we uh, all learned in civics class in high school, the purpose of the United States Senate